Hello, and welcome to the Cultivating Calmness podcast. Thank you for joining me today. I want to talk a little bit about OCD Awareness Month, which is this month, October, and uh, focus a little bit on some of those taboo topics that um, those who suffer from OCD may experience. And having a little knowledge about those things yourself could be helpful in treating them if you are a provider or if you are a friend or a colleague or family member, knowing about some of these things could be helpful for them. I know in the past I've spoken about um, just kind of OCD in general and um, more specifics about OCD. So today I'm not going to kind of uh, maybe bore you with all of that, but just talking um, you know, in a little more direction and a little more specifically about a couple of things today. But um, if you are unaware of what OCD is, OCD stands for Obsessive Compulsive Disorder. And to give you a brief kind of idea or synopsis, an obsession is, is, is an unwanted, intrusive thought, image, or urge um, that can trigger distress, uh, distressful feelings, sensations um, in a person. Okay, and then a compulsion is considered a behavior or thought that people engage in to get rid of the obsession or to decrease their distress. Um, and these are things, uh, the obsessions are things that are usually outside of someone's control. Um, can be sometimes within the norm of route in the realm of normalcy, except that uh, for this person it is not, or uh, be the way that they think about it is um, over the top, right? Uh, so to start, you know, a lot of us, a lot of human beings, myself included, may have thoughts that pop into your head that are, you know, out of your uh, control, out, are outside of your <clears throat> value system, right? You may be driving down the road and maybe you have a thought that, oh, what if I crash this car right now? Or, you know, like, what if, um, you know, that I touch that person? Or what if um, I step on that crack? Or, you know, you, you have these thoughts, but they are just thoughts. Like, they come in your head, you go, huh, that was weird and they leave, or you don't even put that much thought into the thought. It just comes and goes. There's nothing connected to the thought. It's not anything you would ever participate in or worry about because it's not something you want. Obviously, there are people that do want those things. Um, we're not talking about those people. People who suffer from OCD do not want the thoughts that they have. They are distressed and upset by the thoughts that they have. Uh, so when you're a clinician, um, you know, whether you're, what I've witnessed in um, like the clinical setting is that it can be difficult to ascertain what, like the meaning behind those thoughts. So when I'm sitting with someone in my office and I suspect OCD, sometimes we're just trying to determine, is this an anxious thought or is this a, an obsessive thought? Um, and what are you doing about the thought? And oftentimes people who suffer consider it normal but also something that they're plagued with and they don't provide all the information um, and it can be hard to get an accurate diagnosis. So most people who suffer from uh, OCD can go years and years and years and years and years without getting an accurate diagnosis because sometimes we hear the surface level symptoms being talked about, but we don't go any deeper to understand the why and where it's coming from and what they're doing about the thought. And we miss the OCD completely. Um, and the way we treat OCD is much different than we would just treat regular anxiety. Um, so, you know, when you think of OCD, most people, you know, what we see on TV, what we think about, right, are like the excessive hand washing and, you know, being afraid of germs and the you know, like Howie Mandel and um, like lining things up, things having to be like in color order or size order or perfectly aligned, right? Um, or tapping or you know things like that those are the most common things and and those can be pretty common and those are the things that we see with our eyes right but there are a lot of um ocd sufferers who suffer up here right in their heads it's thoughts and you know thoughts only so i have a thought 
and then I think about the thought and I have to think about other things to get rid of the thought and I spend all my time doing that or the actions they're taking aren't as obvious, right? I'm not standing in the bathroom for 20 minutes washing my hands 20 times. I am, um, you know, tapping on the sides of my body or I'm tapping my foot or I'm repeating a phrase in my head or um, I'm checking the stove and I'm checking the stove and I'm checking the stove and I'm checking the stove, you know, or I'm getting other people to do things for me because if I do them, something bad's going to happen, right? So if I'm getting other people to do them, that could get annoying, but we may not um, look at that and say, oh, that's, that's OCD, right? So there are many different themes in OCD. I'm probably not going to name them all. Again, I want to get to talking about some of the taboo topics. Um, but there's, you know, contamination, right? Things are dirty and there's all different types of obsessions and compulsions just around contamination. Again, with all of these, it's not just one thing. There are multiple different things. There are multiple different ways that this can present for somebody. Um, and, you know, I, there's a, um, <clears throat> book that I often reference when I'm with clients who I suspect and there's like multiple multiple pages of just types of obsessions or questions to determine if they're experiencing a certain obsession and that's just from practice that's from experience that the author had and was able to compile this list um, but it still might not include everything um, because there could be things that aren't included in there that they didn't think of um, so you know, religious and moral obsessions. That's like, am I offending God or, um, like obsessing over right and wrong, whether that's with yourself or with the people around you, whether they have done the right thing or the wrong thing, violent obsessions. So, um, that also can fall under some of the taboo, but like, um, thoughts that I am, um, fear that I could hurt somebody or myself or that I have hurt somebody or myself or that I'm going to hurt somebody or myself. Um, responsibility obsession, um, like fear that something terrible is going to happen. It's going to be all my fault. Perfectionism. I think we all understand what that can look like, but uh, that could be fairness or ha I have to remember things. Um, I have to know things. Um, you things along that line, along with the uh, like things have to be perfect. I have to get everything correct. Relationship OCD, you know, are they cheating on me? Do they actually love me? How do I know that they love me? Um, you know, and obviously you can see how that could get in the way of a relationship. And it's not that somebody is jealous, it's that they're suffering from OCD. And so if that's something you are suffering from, you know, having a partner that understands and can help you with that, um, it would be great, but it's also scary to acknowledge to your partner that that is what's going on. Um, identity, um, obsessions. So like, am I gay or, um, you know, am I really a boy or am I really a girl or uh, like who you identify as? Um, it's, it's challenging those thoughts and assumptions. And then anytime that comes up, you're questioning it more so than, right? People who are doing that, um, and have that experience, um, separate from OCD. So OCD is where you're hyper-focused on that question. You can't let it go. Uh, it causes you dis, you know, great distress to be thinking about it, to try to figure out, to try to answer that. Um, even though, you know, on one hand, you know, you know who you are. Um, and you are put in that position because those thoughts um, won't leave you alone. Uh, death obsessions, um, like false memory obsessions. So those are just a handful of topics. I'm sure I missed some, um, but to move on to taboo, like what is taboo? Those are those like things that we don't want to talk about, things that we don't want to acknowledge, things that are not really okay to talk about in society. And yet here these people are uh, experiencing obsessions and compulsions on these topics, which then makes it even harder to talk about because, um, you know, what are people going to think about me? Uh, what are people going, how are people going to treat me if they knew that I was, you know, experiencing this or that I was thinking about this, right? 
Um, so some of the taboo topics, for example, are um, like sexual obsessions. So that's like, you know, you may have thoughts about who you want to have sex with, right? Um, maybe it's ha you know, how I want to have sex with my parent or my sibling or a stranger or in different places where it might be inappropriate or, you know, a coworker or a boss or, right, things that you don't actually want, but the thoughts are there. And that's what I want people to understand is that these are unwanted thoughts um, and urges that they may experience. Uh, and they go against their value system, right? So if you're somebody who believes in like monogamy and, um, you know, waiting like sex till marriage, for example, right? You may, if you start having thoughts about having sex with your friends or your coworkers or, you know, fill in the blank type of person, right? That goes against your value system. And that, therefore, is very distressing. So then you're also questioning, why am I having these thoughts? Am I a bad person for having these thoughts? Are these thoughts, do I really want to do this thing if this thought is in my head? And you can see how you can go down that rabbit hole because of uh, those thoughts that you're having. Um, another taboo topic would be pedophilia. So again, along the lines of sex, but it's, um, right, obviously sex with children, having thoughts about touching children and um, like those images may come into your head, but they are unwanted. You don't want them. Um, and can you imagine having pictures? Like if somebody played a movie in your head of like sex with kids and you don't want to think about that, but it's there and you can't get it out of your head. Right. Or, um, like we talked about violent obsession. So again, that can be taboo. If you had thoughts about killing someone, killing your family members and seeing it in graphic detail, do you think, you know, that would make you feel good? No, it's extremely distressing and upsetting. So then they do, um, they participate in some kind of action or additional thought to get rid of the original thought or to confirm for themselves that they are a good person. And then it has to, it goes on and on and on and on and on um, until they feel better, right? Which could take minutes, could take hours um, until it happens again and again and again and again and again, right? So there are, um, I'll get to some treatment um, options here shortly, but um, like incest is another. Again, these are all kind of follow under that sexual umbrella but these are those more specific topics that happen um, with, uh, that can happen with OCD. And so this, can you imagine like going to talk to somebody, you know, you wanna to go to your doctor, you don't know what's going on and you tell them you're having thoughts about, you know, touching children, what are they gonna do? Like, what are they gonna say, um, right? They might misinterpret that or react to those thoughts that you're having, not truly understanding that it is, you know, OCD related. Now, again, we know that people have those thoughts and urges and act on those thoughts and urges. That is not OCD. And we obviously know that those people exist um, and, and do those things, right? That That is different from OCD. And that's what I want to stress is that, you know, it is different. How do we differentiate that? You know, are we asking the right questions? Are we talking them? Are we trying to understand the why? Are we trying to understand how difficult it is for them. If you suspect OCD with somebody, you know, even putting these out there, these examples, um, so that they know that they exist and they aren't hiding them. You know, I've known people who have disclosed to their therapist and are working on OCD and still won't disclose some of those taboo things. They hold them very close and locked up tight when they go to talk to somebody about it because they're afraid. They're afraid they're going to get locked up. They're afraid they're going to be sent to a hospital. They're afraid, you know, they're going to be arrested. They're going to get in trouble for having these thoughts um, when they they don't want them. So things you can do to try to find out and so you can alleviate some of that distress with your clients or your friends who may be suffering is to put that out there. Let them know, yes, people suffer from this. Yes, people have these thoughts. And yes, I understand you don't want them. Um, so there's also postpartum OCD. So they never had OCD before, but they have it after pregnant, after they've given birth. Um, and you know, again, 
it's re usually related to their baby, hurting their baby, touching their baby, doing something to their baby inappropriately. Um, and they don't want that. They don't want to do that. And so what that can often look like, right, along with many of the others is like avoidance. So I don't change the baby's diaper. I don't change the baby's clothes. I don't give the baby a bath because I'm afraid of these thoughts and what those thoughts could mean about me. And am I actually going to act on those thoughts? Am I actually going to do those things? You know, tr people who truly suffer from OCD are not going to participate in those thoughts. Um, but those thoughts alone can cause, uh, can be a traumatic uh, experience for them, just having those thoughts um, and losing that time with their child um, or their family because they were having those thoughts and they couldn't get them out of their head. And, you know, imagine you know, finally being able to overcome that and then you're later in life and that's what you remember is that you had these thoughts about your child. It's, it's an icky place to be and, you know, People don't like going back and thinking about those things. Um, they just want to forget. Um, then there's like bestiality, necrophilia, OCD. Again, that's a sexual related with animals or dead people, dead things. Um, so you, the thoughts can be endless. Um, the obsessions can be endless related to those things. And I can't stress it enough that they are unwanted. Okay. So uh, like it's hard for people to talk about. I've, I've seen in like therapist groups, I've been in consultations. I've, um, had other clients, you know, I've worked with, talk to me about, um, things that they've been through with their OCD, uh, and what can happen. You know, if somebody doesn't truly understand, you know, they can be, you know, admitted to the hospital, like inpatient, and that can be very traumatic. Uh, because they think, you know, they want to kill somebody, they want to kill themselves when they don't want to do it, but the thought is there. And it's very hard to explain sometimes to people um, that, you know, I don't want these thoughts and they're present, you know, so like you think about those taboo topics and you've been sent to a hospital and they're trying to fix you and they're trying to make you better. And, you know, you're talking about wanting to touch people you shouldn't be touching and, you know, what that could mean for your treatment um, and what kind of things they're going to do or say because you have expressed those distressing thoughts out loud. Um, so treatment can be very difficult if it's not truly understood. So that's um, something I wish that other clinicians would get a handle on is trying to understand that. I compare it to like suicide. I've seen many clients be sent to a hospital um, because they've expressed thoughts of suicide, but there wasn't, um, a, a further assessment done to determine like where those thoughts were coming from, why they're feeling, you know, suicidal, how, like what the plan is, if there's a plan, what, you know, what's going on with those thoughts. There's a lot more involved than just, I want to kill myself. It's, you know, how do you have a plan? Have you done anything? Have you told anybody? Have you, um, is this just a thought? Have you thought you might go any further than that? Are you wishing, you know, and oftentimes, not all the time, obviously there are very, there are cases where yes, people need to be hospitalized that we can't keep them safe. But oftentimes people are just very depressed and they have those thoughts and they're telling you about it and, and they want to trust you and they want to know that you're going to help take care of them and not necessarily send them to a hospital because they've expressed a thought of suicide. Just because they've expressed it doesn't mean that they plan to act on it. Um, now, it's a very delicate topic and we want to make sure our clients are safe, obviously, um, but there is oftentimes more we can do. We can dig deeper to get more um, to the bottom of their symptom before we react. And the same goes for OCD. So uh, again, I'm not going to go into a whole bunch of detail about the treatment options. The gold standard, they say, for uh, OCD treatment is called ERP, Exposure and Response Prevention Therapy. Um, oftentimes what I use to describe it is like, if you are afraid of spiders, you're going to be exposed to spiders in therapy. Um, you know, it, we're going to start with maybe talking about spiders and we're going to talk about like looking at a spider and then we're going to build up to, you know, looking at pictures of spiders and then having fake spiders and then having like fake spiders that look really realistic. And, you know, you build up and up and up until like you can 
touch a real spider, hold a real spider, things like that, right? So that's essentially what you're doing with ERP, with any of the obsessions and compulsions that um, I described here today. ACT is acceptance and commitment therapy is another one that has been used with OCD. Um, Mindfulness-based practices can be used with OCD. ICBT, which is inference-based uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, those all have uh, like research to back um, their effectiveness with OCD treatment. Some will say that EMDR is effective for OCD. Uh, there is a lot of debate about that. I personally haven't used it for OCD, although I think, you know, I'd be interested in trying that. Um, some, you know, where I see it could definitely work is with those traumatic responses to the OCD. You know, as I described um, in the example of the postpartum, right, if they've kind of overcome that OCD piece and they're stuck on that memory that they had this happen and it's difficult to move on from that, right? You may want to do processing with that experience because that was a traumatic experience for them. Even though it was their own thoughts, um, they had to go through that. They had to experience that. They had to have those unwanted thoughts and feelings that they didn't want um, and it, it stuck with them, right? So that's where I could see ER, um, EMDR being effective as far as overcoming the obsessions and compulsions. Um, I don't know how well that would do for... Um, OCD, but I have seen that uh, some people use EMDR for OCD. I have not yet. I still have to, you know, get some education on that, um, although I'd be very interested in seeing how that might work. Um, so I hope you learned something this week um, for our topic on OCD Awareness Month, and um, join me next week, and we'll talk about some more fun and interesting topics. Have a wonderful rest of your day.